welcome and thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Crexy Podcast, an insider's look at all things commercial real estate. This show covers a broad range of topics that cater to commercial real estate newcomers and industry leaders alike. I'm your host, Giannis Papadakis, Business Development Manager at Crexy, a comprehensive digital commercial real estate platform designed to empower commercial real estate professionals with the tools they need to discover and transact property. Today, we are thrilled to dissect the details and latest happenings in the medical office sector with Michael Moreno and Rahul Chajed from Matthews Real Estate. Michael Moreno and Rahul Chajed stand as leaders of the Matthews Healthcare Division at Matthews Real Estate Investment Services. Since 2015, the team has helped lead, manage, and grow the national healthcare practice with Matthews to become a top transactional division nationwide. The Matthews Healthcare Division has successfully transacted with a myriad of clientele, including publicly traded and private REITs, developers, private equity companies, physician groups, single and multi-unit operators, as well as high net worth investors. In 2019, the agents of Matthews Healthcare Division were involved in 130 plus transactions, totaling over 1 million square feet and over $270 million. Michael previously worked at both CVRE and Colliers International, selling single tenant net lease retail properties at the beginning of his career with experience in sales, marketing, and finance. Michael brings a diverse and well-rounded background to better service clients' real estate needs. Rahul has extensive experience selling investment properties with various profiles, including opportunistic, value add, core plus, and core assets across the nation. Michael, Rahul, welcome to the podcast. Let's dive in. Thanks for having us. So I'm curious, I mean, I've got the bio here. How did each of you individually get into commercial real estate when you first started? Michael, if you want, you can dive in first. Yeah. So both of us actually, funny story, uh, we'll get, we'll cut the ice here. So Roll and I have actually known each other since we were six years old. Um, Yeah. And we both started in real estate about the same time. I was at USC. Um, I met the guys from Matthews at a career fair. Um, and you know, just, just start with a company. Um, Rahul was actually working at PWC or were you working there Rahul or just, I had an internship there and a, and a full-time opportunity lined up. Um, and I actually went to UC Santa Barbara and Michael and I obviously just being best friends since we were kids, he had interviewed with the company or I think like met him at the career fair and you know, we would, we would visit all the time, right? I'd go down to USC, he'd come up to UC Santa Barbara and we've always had plans to work together ever since we were kids. And he was like, hey, I found this company. It's a great opportunity. I think it's uh, more of your vibe maybe versus, you know, being an accountant. And so he recommended it. And like fast forward, you know, 30 or 45 days after we had that conversation, I had a job at Matthews and, um, you know, I let PwC know that I won't be, won't be working there anymore. So I honestly had no idea I was going to join commercial real estate. I thought I was going to be an accountant and find my way through finance. Yeah. I've I've known this this guy since I was a kid and I was like, you're, you're not going to be sitting at your desk doing audits every day. Trust me. (laughs) Um, Rahul and I actually, we first started our careers both selling retail buildings. So if you, you know, for, for those that are listening to this, you know, Matthews is, you know, primarily started off as a retail company and, you know, we were a top team in the industry and, we hadn't really ventured into too many different product types when we had started. And, you know, we just saw a cool niche in the healthcare space. And, you know, obviously in hindsight, it looks like we were the smartest guys in the room, but it just happened to happen just because, you know, there was an agent at the company that, you know, ended up not making it, quitting at the company and it left a gap for us. And we just started going full steam in the healthcare, full steam in the healthcare space. Um, so that was what, 2015, like the end of, or was it end of 2016? End of 2016, we really started building out the healthcare practice with the group. Yeah. Interesting. Now, uh, there was a, a vacuum within the office that kind of, you know, led to this opportunistic moment to really yeah. dive into the space. You know, what did you first, what first attracted you to it? I mean, you know, obvious, you know, aside from the obvious of, hey, there was an opportunity here, you know, when you started digging in, and a lot of people don't realize that product types and commercial real estate can can vary, you know, vastly, you know, it's it's way different than owning, managing, brokering apartments or other assets. What were some of the things that you first noticed when you started diving into the space? Yeah, I I think, Raul, you can go in a second here, but, you know, I think what really drew us to the space is, you know, retail has been around for a long time, just as, just as healthcare has been. And we felt like, uh, I know some agents feel when they start that, you know, there's a lot of saturation, you know, you have the 
you know, kind of the, the, the normal players in retail that have been doing it for 20, 30 years. And um, we kind of looked around and said, okay, well, what would be maybe the path of least resistance for us to enter into? You know, there were already very established relationships in retail and, you know, we could have stuck with that and did that and, and really focused our career on that. But we said, okay, well, you know, this kind of fell in our hands, this, this healthcare product type. And we saw a lot of similarities with retail that maybe weren't being factored into the cap rate, the cap rates that investors were paying for medical properties. And we felt there was a good um, niche for us to take advantage of. And, um, you know, we just, just started going full steam ahead. Yeah. And just, just to add to that, you know, like Michael had said, we cut our teeth selling dialysis facilities, right? Like dialysis facilities, which you would kind of call that med tail product, you know, urgent cares, freestanding, you know, ERs, things like that. And, you know, we, we were so active in the space, you know, in a, in a relatively quick amount of time, we ended up selling more dialysis deals than anybody in the country. And, you know, that just coupled with, you know, the fact that there was an opening and like Michael said, just a lot of opportunity in the space and retail being oversaturated, you know, we just said, Hey, look, why don't we venture into this, like fully venture into this healthcare space. Right. And then from there, you know, you fast forward now, we sell everything under the sun from, you know, multi-tenant medical office complexes, ambulatory surgery centers, imaging centers, uh, dental deals, vet deals, really, you name it. Um, so, you know, like Michael said, it, it kind of seems like we're the smartest people in the room, but we kind of just followed the path that presented itself um, and just, just kept going. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, really inspiring, um, especially because I feel like as new agents that come into the space, you know, you're not really given a playbook on what product type to pick. And you just kind of, most agents kind of follow what other agents are doing and are successful with. So it definitely takes, you know, some yeah, guts right. to go into something that, you know, there aren't a ton of other agents in that maybe you don't have as many role models or, yeah. um, you know, direct people within the firm that, you know, can, you know, advise you and guide you. So, um, yeah. you know, hats off to you kudos for you know taking the path less traveled obviously Appreciate it's paid it. off you. yeah and I, now, and I think just just add to that i think like you know when you're a new agent like we've all been there you know you want to you want to have a trajectory to go off of and and you know it's very easy when you start with a company at any company whether it's a, a matthews or a cbre or colliers or marcus whatever it may be you know you start and you'll you know let's just say you start in a starting class of, of 30 other agents and you see one or two of these agents doing well and maybe that guy's doing retail and this guy's doing multifamily and, and, and she's doing industrial. And, and you kind of look around and, and you want to be able to pick something and focus on it and just dive into it, become the specialist. And I think for us, that's something that we had struggled with a bit early on our, in our careers. And, you know, we just couldn't wrap our minds around or commit to just being full retail guys. And, and I think it just worked out to where the healthcare product kind of fit with our personalities better. And we were able to really focus on it and, and, um, you know, build out as much of especially as, as we could at the time and continue to grow it over the past couple of years. Yeah. yeah. That's a very interesting point that you bring up because sometimes, you know, organically your career path will just follow where your interests are and who you're working yeah. with. And I know that when I, when I started in brokerage, I started doing apartments and I quickly learned how much I hated um, brokering apartments. Yeah. Um, my first deal was a nightmare deal. Um, there was a squatter in one of the units. There was a ton of, yeah trash on the property it took six months for the thing to close and i was like Uh who in their right mind would do this and i actually (laughs) transitioned into retail doing single tenant net lease properties because there was a tremendous demand of people selling apartments in southern california at historical low cap rates and then exchanging into you know a burger king out of state and doubling their cash flow getting rid of all the management responsibilities so for me it was just kind of a natural path i'm curious what was the transition like for you going from apartments or sorry, from uh, retail at least into medical office was, you know, there were a pain period there were like, God, I got to start over, build a new database, you know, and start from square one. Yeah. It must've been a little disheartening. Can you talk about it a little bit? Yeah. I mean, Michael, you could, I'll dive into it. And maybe yeah, talk, exactly. you add. But it, it's funny. So Michael started off his career selling paint stores and I started off my career selling, you know, gas stations. And, you know, eventually we, you know, like, like we said earlier, we started selling dialysis facilities but it wasn't as linear of a path as you would think, right? It was definitely like there were some ups and downs and some left turns and some right turns. Um, you know, for a while we were like, hey, we, we should dedicate half of our time to doing what we do, which is what we specialize in. And then half of our time doing, you know, dialysis, right? And then it was like, okay, well maybe we should do like 75, 25. 
or hey, this government product type looks interesting. Like maybe we should do this, right? So it did take a little bit of time where we were like, hey, we just need to commit to our business and commit to the product type. But it it wasn't as linear, maybe as like methodical as you would, as you would think. Um, you know, just transitioning like, hey, I'm gonna slowly transition from retail to healthcare. It was like we we transitioned from retail to healthcare, but the but the road wasn't it wasn't as as clear or as smooth as maybe you you would think. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. And I think and I think part of the also difficulty in in making that adjustment is, you know, Yanni, I mean, you kind of alluded to this in our first year or two in our career, we're building these relationships in the, in the retail space, you know, we're going to ICSCs and meeting developers and institutions and tenants and all these guys out there. And then, you know, as you build relationships with the guys, they're going to call you and look to you and say, Hey, you know, can you sell my retail building? Can you advise me on this? And then we had to look at ourselves and say, okay, well, we can either kind of be one toe in one toe out for the rest of our careers, or we can really just dive in. And that's, that's where whole said, like, at a time we were like, hey, maybe we do 25% retail, 75% medical. Um, but I think it was around 20, I want to say maybe like late 2016, mid 20 or early 2017, we were just like, hey, every retail account we get, we're going to bring in, you know, other brokers at Matthews that we know can service these, but we're going to spend our time focusing on healthcare. Yeah. And, you know, there's some similarities, obviously, between retail and healthcare, like, you know, there's still triple net leases and, you know, similar size buildings. And, and, you know, if you look, and we can probably get into this a little bit later on, but, you know, a lot of those healthcare operators are getting into retail facing locations. Yeah. But there's definitely a learning curve. You know, if you're looking at a surgery center with, you know, three ORs versus a jack in the box that you can just look and say, okay, well, you know, this rent to sales ratio is 4%. The site does well. Like there, there's, there's, you have to sharpen your tools a little bit and get a separate set of tools to figure out, okay, you know, how do I evaluate this deal for my client or for my, um, you know, buyer or seller to really provide a catered, you know, uh, specialized brokerage service to them. Absolutely. And, and we are going to touch on that too. You know, here in our next section, we're going to dive in and focus a little more closely on the medical office sector, where it's been, right. where it's heading. Um, what would you say are the fundamentals that investors need to keep in mind when investing in medical offices? Like, for example, who are the tenants? Um, you know, doctors, vets, dentists, talk about who is owning and leasing this space. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the retail space is a little bit different and, and this is, it's good that we're having this conversation because in retail, for example, if I am, let's just say I'm a physician and I'm selling, you know, a apartment building and I want to buy a retail property, like my usual investigation is going to come across some national, national tenant names that I can just really focus on, you know, whether it's, a 7-Eleven or a McDonald's or a Chick-fil-A or whatever it may be, like you're typically buying a very standard triple net lease with a, an A credit rated company. Then there, and really it's, it's for the most part, pretty easy to look through and not easy to understand. Um, you don't have too many, you know, single to, you know, three unit operated retail buildings that are trading. Um, I mean, you'll see, you're trying to see some more sell lease back work in the space with, with some more mom and pop operators. But for the most part, most people look at retail and say, you know, these are national tenants. Mm -hmm. In the healthcare world, there's a, there's a very, very wide variety. You know, you'll have some of your, you know, core health system tenants, um, you know, Ascension Health, or let's just say like, you know, a DeVita dialysis, but you also have, you know, um, you know, Rahul Surgery Center, <laughs> and he runs a practice and, you know, he has, you know, let's just say three other positions in that practice. And, um, you know, they have a certain amount of revenues and patients that they see, and you have to be able to dive into that and understand, okay, well, maybe on the surface, this isn't as easy to understand as a Chick-fil-A or a McDonald's lease or a 7-Eleven's lease, but how can we paint the picture and how can we present and understand the security that actually underlies this investment and, you know, make the argument that maybe this is a better investment than a 7-Eleven or a Dollar General because the site does well, it's in a good payer mix community, um, it's you know, out, out, out partial to a hospital, whatever it may be. Um, does that answer your question or at least some of it? It does, it does. Okay. I mean, th there's complexity within the product type is what I'm understanding. Yeah, there is. Um, and, and it sounds like you know, the learning curve to you know, really dig in and underwrite these deals is kind of a substantial one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're they're atypical, right? They're special use type buildings. Like you said, I mean, you look at a Chick-fil-A that's on a 20-year lease, 
I mean, it's pretty much going to be priced the same, you know, right. regardless of what market it's in. Maybe with like a twenty five cap rate on there. Exactly. Yeah, maybe with like a twenty five basis point, you know, variance, right? Um, right. But there's a lot more that goes into these surgery centers or these different medical office buildings. You have to look at the financials. Um, you know, what is, what is the financial performance? Is it covering the rent? What is the caseload? What was the tenant investment in the building? Um, you know, are you buying it? massively above replacement cost, uh, close to it. So, you know, I think you, you have to do a little more due diligence versus just maybe buying a, a bond that's, you know, backed by Dollar General, right? Yeah. Because like Michael right. said, it's not like, you know, corporate deals are prevalent all throughout healthcare. And a majority of them are physician credit. And you just have to understand the story, you know, how they play into the community, how long they've been there, how they've been doing. So a little bit of that extra due diligence and just that experience, um, you know, goes a long way. Yeah. Now, what is currently happening within the medical office sector? And well, actually, let's take it back. Pre-COVID, what was going on in the medical office sector? You want to go or me? Um, you, you can go. I'll, okay. I'll take the next question. Okay. Um, so I guess to, to better answer that, are you talking about in terms of like the investment sales market or just in terms of like the operations or like? Well, you know, largely, you know, I'm sure you've seen in the last year and a half, there's been an, a, a pretty big shift in, I guess, investor demand for certain products. Sure, yeah. I would imagine that healthcare, you know, being as, you know, we've been in the center of a, you know, healthcare crisis, you sure. know, a, a medical crisis nationwide, you know, how has that affected or changed things? You know, what were we seeing pre-COVID? And then let's talk about the effect that COVID has had. And what we're looking at now. Yeah. So I, I always say this to clients, like COVID has been terrible. You know, it's not an ideal situation. It's a, it's a bad situation. And, you know, I wish we weren't in it, but if we can find any silver lining in, in COVID is it really did fully support and provide really a proof of concept for the, the healthcare real estate industry. Right. And I mean, from a valuation standpoint, we've probably seen, you know, 10 to 20% increase in prices like year over year on an identical asset in the space. And really there's, there's a lot of different factors behind that. Like we can get into the whole like tax law and, and potential tax change. That's, you know, increasing transaction volume. But the biggest thing that we saw that changed sentiment overall from investors is, you know, if I'm a retail owner and I own a casual dining facility or I own a, you know, a large shopping center, like I probably got hit hard during COVID. Um, and, and some operators actually haven't bounced back since then. So if I'm looking out there and maybe I, I got burned on a couple of deals and now I'm saying, okay, what am I going to buy? The first question I'm going to ask is, has this tenant stayed open and has this tenant paid rent throughout COVID? And in most situations, like most of the guys we talk to, one, they pretty much all stayed open or at least been able to pay rent and function throughout, for, throughout the pandemic. Um, you know, I mean, there's obviously variations between, between that. There's some guys that did better, some guys that did worse. Um, but two, I mean, there's some clients, especially like in the veterinary industry, for example, I mean, we have so many clients have said, Hey, we did 50% better in 2020 than we did in 2019. And that's because if you go on Instagram, everybody's, you know, gotten a dog or a cat over the past couple of years. Um, so <laughs> that's really just pushed a lot of owners to take a, a serious, a serious viewpoint and a serious interest in the healthcare space and really propped up values. Yeah. And a, and a build off of that too. I mean, so much of just the net lease market as a whole is is fueled by 1031 exchange money, right? And so much of so much of the decision making, you know, in terms of you know sizing up an acquisition if you're a 1031 exchange investor, you know, it's very psychological, right? It's very emotional. It's making sure that safety is probably the number one thing uh, to consider, right. right, when buying an asset. And so obviously you look at a product type like healthcare, right, or like a vet hospital or whatever it is, you know, these all stayed open during COVID. So naturally 1031 exchange investors along with their brokers are going to recommend this sort of product. Right. And so that's really also, I think, another thing that's that's boosting demand um, in the space. And not to mention, I mean, even these surgery centers, right? I mean, healthcare as a as a as an industry, it's need based, right? Like you can't just people aren't just gonna stop getting dial, uh, you know, dialysis or getting elective surgeries, right? For a little bit during COVID, elective surgeries were on pause. And then right. what do you know, as soon as as soon as it picked back up, surgery centers just started flooding, right? And they started doing yeah. even better. That's why you look at a lot of these PLs from some you know solid regional operators they they ended up rebounding and and exceeding what they've rebounding from COVID and then also exceeding you know what they've ever done in the past uh, just as a result of that so you know like Michael said there's been a lot of demand and and as a result of compression on cap rates and increases of price 
Yeah. And just, just to, to double down on something Roll said, yeah, that, that pent up demand is, is it's huge because let's say, for example, you're sitting on your couch one day and you're like, I want to get a cheeseburger. And you, you go and you drive outside and find out the Burger King's closed. A week later, you probably have already got changed your mind and now you don't really want a cheeseburger anymore. Let's, let's fast, let's back, let's rewind a little bit. You're sitting on your couch and you're like, dang, I need a root canal. And you drive to the dentist and the dentist is closed. That next week, you're still gonna need a root canal. It doesn't matter, that demand's still there. And as, as long as that supply opens up, that, that, that need's gonna be filled. So that's, right. that's what we look, look at in the, in the healthcare space rather and, and why so many healthcare operators bounce back a lot quicker than retail operators. Interesting. It's a good point. So, it's, a good way, it's a good way to look at it. <laughs> that that's <laughs> that is illuminating, and I, it makes me wonder what kind of changes are you noticing now in a post-COVID world within the sector. I mean, there's the rise of you know telehealth. Yeah. There's boutique clinics that pop, are popping up. I feel like everywhere around me. Um, what, what are you seeing in a post COVID world? That's like, Hey, this is, this is kind of here to stay. This is how we're going to operate now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, you know, with telehealth, there's, it's kind of just been this buzzword that's been going around and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, the spending on telehealth is going crazy. The projections are, you know, monumental in terms of what you're going to see in 2025, 2026, in terms of like adoption of telehealth. But if anything, I think it's going to complement, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of these practices, right. At the end of the day, like if you have a broken arm, you're still going to the urgent care. Right. At the end of the day, you're not, you're not fixing that with a telehealth call. Yeah, yeah, you're not you're not getting a, a blood transfusion or, or a knee replacement surgery through telehealth. Right. So I think, right. um, you know, just as an industry and just as, you know, observers of, of any sort of industry. Right. You, you take a look at certain things like, OK, what's going to be the disruptor? Like what's what's going to be the thing that what's the next buzzword? Healthcare? Yeah, exactly. And if anything, I think the best way to look at it is, hey, this is just going to boost access to healthcare. Right. It's going to boost access to networks. Right. Uh, for patients, you know, they're it's going to add to health systems, patient bases. Right. So I, I think telehealth is something that's, you know, going to is definitely on the rise. I just don't think it's going to be displacing or, you know, massively disrupting the industry by any means. Yeah. Michael, I, don't, I don't know if you. Yeah, add to that. I, I agree. I was, were you going to ask a question? I was, I was going to say, I, I happen to agree. I think it's going to complement it tremendously. I mean, just think about the, the accessibility that somebody has that, you know, maybe, you know, they did ha have a, a tooth pain, but they couldn't get to the dentist's office that yeah. week, right? Now they can, you know, have a direct channel to a medical professional that says, yeah, absolutely, you need to get this done, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like if anything, that is going to you know, increase the flow of patients to physical locations because yeah. you're giving accessibility to people that otherwise may not have made it through the door. Yeah, right. You're right. And, and, there, and there's a, a, a word that you, that you see thrown around a lot in the healthcare space. Um, it's acu acuity. And what acuity just basically means is the, the, the level of severeness, or I'm going to botch the, the actual Webster definition, but let's, let's, let's go with the brokerage definition. <laughs> um, the, the, the level of severeness your, your injury or your ailment requires in terms of, of treatment. So what Rahul and I like to focus on is higher acuity medical buildings. And what that basically means is that those are the buildings, for example, like a surgery center, an imaging center, a, you know, let's just say a veterinary clinic, you know, services that, that require more care for those patients versus let's just say you have a, an allergy, for example, and all you need is you need a prescription for you know, the latest allergy medication. Like you can call your, you do the telehealth and, and call your, your, your doctor and, and tell them your symptoms. And, you know, that pretty much handles it. Most of the buildings that we sell are of higher acuity. So again, you know, dialysis clinic, surgery centers, things of, the, of that nature. And because of that, they haven't really been displaced, you know, from, you know, by telehealth, just like you said, more, it's a supplemental add on to provide a easier access for patients to actually then come to location. if They do need higher acuity care. Right. Right. So let's let's do my favorite part. Let's get into the numbers. What does the current trading volume look like in the medical office sector? How are we trending? You know, is it a buyer's market, a seller's market? Where let's take the pulse. Yeah. Right now, I mean, it is absolutely without a doubt a seller's market. I mean, the, and we already talked about this. I mean, the values we've been getting on deals is unlike any, anything we've ever seen. Um, and I always give this example to our clients. If we were selling a deal in 2019, 
we're probably getting five to 10 offers per deal. The deals we're selling in 2020 or 2021 and, and, and end of 2020, I mean, we're getting 10 to 20 offers per deal. Wow. There is just so many buyers out there that are buying deals that have pushed up values. And you're seeing it across the board, you know, regardless of the asset class. Um, you know, my parents are, are residential realtors and they'll, they'll, they'll list a property for, you know, two and a half million and it'll sell at 3.8 million. So you're just seeing so many more buyers for such a confined amount of product and supply that values have really gone through the roof. And Rahul had actually talked about this a little bit, a little bit earlier, but beyond, you know, the, the healthcare space being a, a safe haven for security, there's just so many investors out there that are buying to avoid potentially paying 1031 exchange or, or capital gains taxes if they increase in 2022. Um, you know, them worrying about maybe the 1031 exchange going away. So all of this is really just created, you know, a unique incubator of activity that, you know, obviously us as, as primarily sell side brokers and, you know, the sellers we work with get to capitalize on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, interest rates are, are low, right? You have inflation on the horizon. You know, people are wondering what are going to happen to rates in the next six to nine months. So they're baking that in and saying, Hey, look, you know, let's kind of take advantage of the market that we're in today. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah. So to add to what Michael's saying too, is you also have commodity prices um, that are going through the roof, right? Like if you look at steel, if you look at lumber, right? If you look at, you know, what COVID's done to the entire supply chain, it's massively slowed it down, right? Like if you look at the port, you know, near Long Beach, right? Or San Pedro, I mean, they're back Huge up. line, huge exactly. line of ships. I and see it every time I go to my cousin's house. Exactly. So the delivery of materials is just like substantially slowed down. And as a result, you have prices just going through the roof, right? And so for a lot of sellers, right, you know, obviously, or for developers, right, prices of building are going up, right? The rents that the tenants need to pay to support that level of building is going up, right? And so naturally, as a result of that, prices are going up as well. So obviously, you have the economic condition, right? You have interest rates, you have a potential change in tax code, but you also have a massive supply chain issue as a result of COVID, that's also driving up prices of materials and therefore the, the price of the final product. So, Interesting. so that's, that's another thing to, to think about as well. So we had touched on this briefly earlier, um, the retailization of the kind of the healthcare sector, you know, you're starting to see, you know, these walk-in clinics, clinics within, you know, the national drug store. Um, how is that changing? you know, investor appetite, it's, you know, and I, I don't know much about this sector. So, you know, you can treat me as, as um, you know, the one that you're educating on this. Was it primarily doctors owning these properties before? And has that shifted to, you know, just pure investors that, you know, are seeing the value of having these essential tenants, you know, leasing to them? Sure. Oh, should I go? Um, yeah, 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 I mean, you know, historically, I mean, you're right. You know, majority of medical buildings has been owned by physicians, health systems, operators, whatever it may be. But you're seeing starting to see that start to shift hands. Um, and I think to go to your point about the retailization of healthcare is, and it's it's interesting because LA is is different than a lot of other. I mean, we're in LA, and, and the markets that we look at when we're driving down the street are different than you know Midwest markets or markets in the Southeast. Like we've always driven by you know, a large hospital or urgent cares or dental offices like that was just because I mean, we're, we're all condensed and, and you just see it as you're driving. But if you go to let's just say a, I don't know, a Midwest marketing, I mean, you name it, you're starting to see a lot more of those we call them dock in a box, you know, medical facilities pop up where you know, the uh, the, the Circle K went vacant. Oh, sorry, Roll. I roll, I roll used to sell Circle Ks. Um, the Circle K went vacant, and now you have an urgent care in there, or the Walgreens went vacant, and now you have a plasma facility in there. So you're seeing a lot more client facing healthcare products. And that hasn't had like a tremendous effect on like values, I would say, but people are becoming more aware of yeah. these type of products. So I guess that that's something I can add. I would say, the retailization of healthcare is just increased awareness of the healthcare space. You know, historically, I think a lot of people makes people feel a lot of times healthcare has historically made people kind of feel a little icky and push back a little bit. Like, I don't want to be involved with this healthcare thing, you know, like, yeah, I don't keep it kind of out of sight. But now you're having urgent cares, you're having plasma facilities, dialysis clinics, you know, being out parcel to a Walmart. And that's just increasing the overall. Um, understanding and interest in the space because it's so prominent now versus what it was previously. 
Right. And is and, it just me or did you notice that at some point over the last 10 years, like the medical offices started hiring better architects? Like, no, I feel exactly. like the medical yeah. offices of like the 90s and like where I grew up were often yeah. like really drab, you know, uninteresting looking buildings. And now, you know, I don't know whether to, you know, get my temperature taken or, you know, order an IPA. When yeah, I drive exactly. by <laughs> start checking to your you know, hotel room. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. It's, it's all about enhancing the, the patient experience. Right. And, you know, that's what you're seeing a lot of, like some of these places look like resorts. Right. And I mean, I think it's a great change in the industry. Right. Who wants to go? I mean, it already sucks having to go get a surgery or go to the hospital. Right. You might as well at least like where you're staying. Might as well have something good the, the yeah, gram while that. you're in there. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I actually did want to say one more thing. This is building off of what Michael just said. He actually brought this up earlier on the call is, you know, initially just as a result of the lack of awareness, there was a mispricing of medical office assets, right? And I think go, the retailization, essentially what that's done is just made it, essentially healthcare has become more of a household type, nest, a household name, right? In, in the net lease space. And just as a result of there just being awareness, it's not necessarily that it's boosted prices above where they should have been. It's just coming to kind of to equilibrium, right? It's, it's essentially creating awareness and bringing these prices to where they actually should have always been trading. It validates the, the thesis that, hey, these are solid investments that you should be paying attention to. I mean, I, I know when I was at Marcus selling drugstores, you know, sometimes you'd have clients that would, you know, have you know, less favorable opinion of a drugstore. You know, I think at the time Amazon was getting in with pill pack and they were like, well, you know, drugstores, you know, how long are they actually going to be around? And then you add to that, you know, the prospect of, well, no, there's a walk-in clinic. There is, there are patients that go in here, it makes it a much stickier tenant. And I feel like right. the retail investors, you know, what do you prefer the, the drugstore or the drugstore with, you know, the added benefit of having, you know, this other layer of stickiness to yeah. the location. Yeah, that's yes, awesome. Really right. <clears throat> so tell me a little bit about, okay, what should buyers look for? You know, if I'm an investor and I'm looking to, you know, spend some money and invest in something and I'm looking at the medical office space, what should I be paying attention to? You know, explain to me like I'm five. Yeah. So I think the interesting thing, I mean, in any market, I mean, right now we're in a bull healthcare real estate market. And in any time when you have a situation like this, where there's such a frenzy, and buying these types of assets, you know, you can start to look at things with a bit of a, a gray lens. And what I mean by that is you start to look at things very similarly. And regardless of the healthcare building, you just know that healthcare is a, you know, a, a growing asset and, and a, a great asset. So you're just going to buy the deal because it's healthcare, right? And, and part of our job is really educating investors and making them understand like, yes, this could be a surgery center. And this, this yes, this could be a great building, but just because it's a surgery center doesn't mean it's a great building. Right. And it's figuring out, okay, what are the different factors that we have to dive into in a building to better understand its viability? And we talked about this earlier, earlier like most medical buildings, you're not going to get a revenue statement and figure out, okay, what's the revenue? What's their sales? Okay. The rent to sales is this, they're, they're doing great. You know, let, let's buy this deal. You have to really start to become a bit more investigative. Um, you have to understand, okay, well, if it's a dialysis clinic, for, for example, how many stations does it have? How often is it open? If it's a surgery center, what's its payer mix? Is it private? Is it public? Um, you know, how many physicians do they have? What's the age? What are the ages of the physicians? What's their su succession planning? Um, you know, in a lot of these locations, like you could have a, a surgery center that has done phenomenal. Let's just say it's done, I don't know, 10, 12 million dollars in sales, right? And then you look at that and say, okay, well, this, this site's doing really well. I want to buy this building. But then you, you look under the hood and realize the lead physician brings in 80% of the revenue and the lead physician is 85 years old. And then you look at that and say, okay, well, maybe this isn't the best deal. You know, if this is a Walgreens or this is a, a CVS, they just hire the next, you know, next uh, pharmacist or, 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 or clerk to come in there. You know, these medical buildings really do benefit from the actual physicians that are bringing in and working in day in and day out. Um, and that can provide a lot of upside for investors, but that can also provide downside as well. So we just want to make sure that people are, you know, one, asking the right questions, but also two, working with the right brokers who, who understand. And, and, you know, obviously this could sound like a pitch for us, but I mean, it doesn't need to be me or a whole, it can be any healthcare specific broker in the country. Um, you know, you want to have a specialized lens when looking at these buildings. Absolutely. Yeah, perfectly said. Yeah. <clears throat> now, 
last question on this, and then uh, we'll move along to our, our, our final topic. Uh, what should, if I'm an investor in, let's say, a non performing asset, big box retail, for example, what should we look for when seeking to convert you know, that non performing asset into a medical office? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we touched on it earlier, right? Being accessible, having a high level of visibility, being in a, in a dominant retail corridor, right? Those things are very important, right? Just because the trend of healthcare is, hey, how accessible are we, right? How, how easy is it? How convenient is it for patients to actually come to the location, right? That's one thing. Also through a conversion opportunity, you, you will, I mean, this comes up all the time with developers, right? It seems like it'd be the perfect fit. And then all of a sudden you realize they don't have the parking capabilities. Right. Parking is huge. Right. Um, I think it's it's five to one um, is uh, what the what the co or the ratio is supposed to be. Uh, but I, I would think those are the two most important things to look at uh, when initially sizing up an asset or uh, an opportunity like that. Yeah. So let me just make sure I got the hot points. Obviously, location first, location last, location, location, location. But as well, you know, what is who's actually in there operating, right? What is the age of the position? You know, what does their succession plan look like? It seems like aside from a deal having to have, you know, the basics that you want, you know, solid fundamentals for any commercial real estate deal, there is this other layer of these variables that you really do need a team like yourselves that can dig in and say, hey, here's a red flag or, or no, here's exactly why this is the deal and here's why. Yeah. You know, I feel like there's a lot of things that you could miss if you're working with the wrong person. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of our discussions right now have been more related to, like I say, a lease back as we do a lot of those, but there also are more, let's just say retail quality tenants in the healthcare space. And we'll talk a little about this earlier. Like you still have a, you know, an advocate health who signs a long-term lease and he has, they have a credit and, you know, similar to like a 7-Eleven. So when you're looking at a deal like that, like maybe you don't need to get as nitty gritty as you may need to, if you're buying a, you know, a one or two unit operated facility. Um, but it's just, it's just good to have an understanding of all these different types of aspects to look at when you're doing these deals. Right. So you've got a, an opportunity to answer kind of a challenging question. Um, I've worked with a number of medical professionals when I was on the brokerage side of the, uh, uh, of the table and helping them you know, invest in net lease assets. And I can tell you that from my experience, working with a doctor in particular, when they're looking to buy and invest, let's say a retail triple net asset, um, it, it's a little bit different op dealing with a doctor than it is with you know, other professionals. Mm -hmm. Not to ask, not asking you to you know, beat up on your clients, but is there a level of difficulty or a learning curve in, you know, dealing with those clients not, and any, not any advice that you have? Yeah. It's not necessarily just as a result of, you know, their personality or who they are, but it's just generally like, that's just what, what they're doing is they're, they're full-time focused on taking care of people. Right. I mean, they have a busy, they have a busy career, right. They're busy all the time. And, and many times they don't have the, the time to look at real estate, um, you know, moves or, or, or different, different business sorts of, um, you know, avenues or investments. Right. And so just as a, as a nature of what they focus on. Right. But that's our job to be able to speak their language and be able to kind of acclimate to, you know, who they are and be able to serve them best, you know, and then many times too, like doctors, they'll, they'll own a surgery center or an imaging center or whatever it is with six, seven, eight, 12 doctors. Right. And so just as a, as a result of the structure of the organization and just how, you know, busy they are with their time. Sometimes obviously they could be a little bit of a delay or, you know, sometimes it take a little bit longer to make decisions, but um, you know, it's not necessarily just because they're you know, medical professionals. Right? Amazing. Well, yeah, the, the one, the one piece of advice I give to anybody who's going to work with uh, physicians is learn this valuable word, patience, patience. And, and, and like, wait, wait, pa patience, no, patience, like patience, patience, no, like, no pun intended. Yeah. No pun God. intended. Yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> patience. Um, because I mean, these, you know, if you're a physician and you will run a successful practice, like your time and in your, your, your headspace and your mental capabilities are focused to, to treating patients. So right. the other type of patients. So if you are now looking at a real estate investment, this is a whole new world. You need to have patience and you need to be able to walk through each, each aspect, aspect of the deal step-by-step step and make sure that 
everything is being received the same way that you're putting it out. Because sometimes, you know, a lot of us, if you're in real estate, we throw terms around like cap rate and um, pro forma and, you know, Argus and rent roll and all these things out all the time. And we don't realize these aren't common words you're going to hear thrown around a doctor's office. Yeah, so it's about right. breaking it down and saying, okay, well, do you understand what this means and how this affects you moving forward? So patience. Yeah. I love it. That's great advice. It, any it any nice. other any other parting words for any of our listeners or brokers looking to become more active in the sector, or maybe yeah. they see one of your deals listed and they want to work it as a buyer's agent. Yeah. What, what parting words do you have for the market? I guess um, to, to the last question, if anybody's looking at one of our deals and they want to bring a, bring a buyer, obviously we, we would love the opportunity, you know, give us a call, shoot us a text, email, um, you know, we're, we're, we're very busy and, and we man manage a team, but we'll do our best to get in contact with you ASAP. And, um, you know, text and, and calling us is probably always the best means of communication. Um, for anybody that, and this is more towards agents that may want to have, it may have an interest in getting to the healthcare space. I would say if you're going to get into the healthcare space, and I know there's agents out there that think about it all the time, because they'll see an agent close a healthcare deal and they'll think, Hey, I want to do this. I would say, Find yourself a good mentor or a good team that you can learn from and get your bearings with. Because I think a lot of times what happens is you have agents that enter the space and they just they just wing it. And, and when they wing it, it really does hurt the overall market because then you have situations where you have brokers bring buildings to market that are overpriced, that are underpriced, that are just completely out of whack. And that affects yeah. You know, the work that developers are doing, that institutions are doing, that brokers are doing. So you just want to make sure you're doing things the right way. Um, and, you know, we, we've had a, a couple mentors in our life, one of which Kyle Matthews, our CEO, and um, a lot of the things we've accomplished in our career. Um, you know, obviously, I, I always want to give credit to, uh, to myself, but when, when, you, when you break it down, you know, having a good mentor is instrumental and, and crucial uh, into reaching to where you, want to, where, where you want to reach in this business. Awesome. I mean, very true words, no matter what um, you know, area within the industry or really any industry you pick, if you find somebody that's, that's doing it, that can be a good mentor for you, can really accelerate your, uh, your ramp up to, to get in there and doing it. Yeah. Um, gentlemen, really appreciate you both taking the time to you know, help us you know, learn more about this space. Um, really, thanks for sharing your insights. Yeah, yeah of course. Thanks for having us. This was awesome great. hearing about your journey. I'm excited yeah. to see what else you guys get into. Yeah. Um, really appreciate your time. I know you're super busy, so thank you for taking the time to sit down with us. And where can people find you online if they want to get in touch? So LinkedIn, email, yeah, yeah. Our, our website. Um, I don't know if, if there's going to be like a, uh, our content information on this or anything like that, but if you could put that, that could also work. What, what's but, your uh, website? It's just the website's www.matthews.com and you just, you can go and search us on the, the company website or on LinkedIn. Excellent. Yeah. Social media, you guys uh, put, cranking out office, medical office memes. <laughs> <laughs> no, we get that. That's our next venture. Yeah. All right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Social media, LinkedIn, keep the Instagram a little bit more private, but yeah. uh, LinkedIn is where you can find some of the stuff we put out. Got it. Well, gentlemen, right. thank you again. And thank, thank you. you to everyone who tuned in today. If you enjoyed this episode, do not miss the next one. Visit go.crexy.com forward slash podcast and sign up to get the next episode delivered straight to your inbox. Of course, you can also subscribe to the Crexy podcast on your favorite podcast app and check out our YouTube channel for video recordings of each episode. Take care and be sure to tune in next time. Mm -hmm.